<laughs> Get bored. Oh, I won't. All right. Um, so like you said, I'm a biologist at Natchitoches National Fish Hatchery. So um, I just brought a little slideshow here. I'll talk about what we do at the hatchery and then I'll kind of dive a little more into the muscle specific stuff um, in more of a general sense too. So um, the screen's a little small, bear with me. If you guys need to see anything at the end, you wanna come up to my computer, I can go back and show you some stuff too. And then I have some of our sampling gear that you guys can kind of check out at the end as well. Um, so this is an aerial view of the hatchery. Uh, we, we have, um, most of the ponds are filled here. And um, then that's our entrance sign right there. So when you, when you come by, you'll see this out front and then we have a little public aquarium that's open every day but federal holidays. Uh, we have about 53 ponds and they average about 0.8 acres. Um, some of them are up to an acre, some of them are a little bit less. And we're the third largest federal hatchery in the Southeast region. Uh, so the early species, when the hatchery first started in the 1930s, um, we originally were doing largemouth bass, bluegill, red ear sunfish, and channel catfish as part of our recreational fisheries and to supply food to the local community and to the farmers because it was the Great Depression. And so um, we, we were part of that really important asset locally to help keep people fed and keep farmers moving um, with some of that stuff. So today, um, we still do recreational fisheries, but we've also added some different stuff. Um, there's different mandates. We have the Endangered Species Act, which came about in the 1970s. And so we kind of have three different levels of work that we do, and then we do um, some control of non-native non species. So our recovery work is kind of our highest level of work, and that's for anything that is federally listed as threatened or endangered. Um, some species are listed at a state level and not a federal level or vice versa. And some are listed at both. Some may be state endangered and federally threatened. Um, but as long as it's federally threatened, that falls under recovery for us. Um, we have recreational fisheries and that's on both federal and state lands. That's for the public to enjoy. Um, and we also work with um, the tribal nations around here. And then restoration. These are for populations that are declining or depleting. And so um, we'll work with species like paddlefish and alligator gar. And then alligator gar also double as non-native species control. And so at the hatchery, we currently have two species that are federally threatened. We have the Louisiana pearl shell mussel, and then we have gopher tortoise. And so we're, we, both, we have ongoing programs for both of these species right now at the hatchery. Uh, recreational, we work with the state, so we work with LDWF. Um, they survey a lot of the waters around here, and they have a, a five-year rotation of stocking that they do typically. And so we'll work with them. We have all the ponds, and they'll bring us larval fish, and we'll help grow them out, and then they get stocked all over the state. A lot of stuff goes in Toledo Bend and Black Lake and, and the, the big concentrated areas with the, a lot of fishing pressure, um, but we stock lots of smaller areas with them as well. Uh, restoration, like I said, we've got paddlefish, the alligator gar fall under here a little bit, and then we also have alligator snapping turtles. Um, so we have a Head Start program for those guys, and they, um, they're actually a candidate species. So a uh, different part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is currently reviewing all the data we have across their whole range to decide if they are um, at a level that can deem them threatened or endangered at the federal level. And so we're waiting for um, a ruling to come out to say if they get listed or not. And then they'll end up in our recovery program rather than the restoration level. And then our non-native controls, uh, alligator gar. These guys, um, one, they're a, a local megafauna. People find them very cool and interesting. Um, their populations are declining in some areas, but they're really good at in, um, eating invasive fish like the carp. Um, silver carp and big head carp. And so we try to put a bunch of these guys out in areas that are being affected by those species right now. Um, so recovery, we've got the Louisiana pearl shell mussel. This is um, where I spend most of my time. Um, these guys, like I said, are federally threatened. They're only found in Grant and Rapides Parish here in Louisiana out of the entire world. Um, there's the Alabama pearl shell, which is found in a few locations in Alabama, but they've fully diverged uh, over, over time. And so these populations have been declining throughout um, the past several decades. And so 
our job is to help try to improve those populations and to get the numbers back to a stable, um, self-sustained um, level. Um, so they inhibit, uh, you, they're found within s small streams, which are seep fed. So in the summer, they only get up to about 70 to 75 degrees for the most part, where most of the water around here is really warm. The water is really clear there, um, really shallow, typically swift moving. Um, but um, so they're found in a really unique ecosystem throughout the state. Um, a, a lot of their beds are found throughout Kasachi, different areas of Kasachi, but there's also a lot of them on private land. So we work with the U.S. Forest Service to do a lot of the Kasachi work, and then we also work with the state. They do most of the private land work. So we have two local uh, broodstock sources where we collect um, adults from to, to do our program, which we'll get into a little bit more later. And one is on each side of the Red River because they are genetically distinct populations from each other. Um, the Red River acts as a barrier for those two mixing. So we try to, we try to replicate that in our, in our production. Um, the main threats to these guys are habitat destruction. Uh, beaver dams can be bad for these guys. If they dam up one of those creeks, the water starts to warm and it gets above their threshold. Um, other places, beaver dams are great, but not specifically for these guys. Um, and then increased sediment load. A lot of this is ATVs, construction, infrastructure, forestry practices, farming, that kind of stuff. So the runoff will come in and bring in too much sediment. Um, so this is just kind of the life cycle of the freshwater mussels and they actually have a parasitic life stage and so the adults uh, what will happen is the males will release their sperm into the water column and as the females are filter feeding they bring that sperm in and they fertilize their eggs and then they'll brood those for a little bit and when they're ready they have to get attached to a host and that's typically a fish or some mussels use large salamanders like hellbenders and mud puppies. And then once it's on the fish, each mussel has a different time period, which it'll stay attached to the gills or the fins, and then they'll drop off into the sediment where they'll grow back into adults. And so we'll dive into that a little more specifically later too. And if you guys have questions during this, feel free to, to throw them out. So how, how long is the life cycle? Um, each mussel is a little bit different. So for Louisiana pearl, sh pearl shells specifically, they take seven to nine years to become reproductive. Other mussels can reproduce within the first or second year. So these guys are a little bit longer lived, I think upwards of 30 years. Some species of mussels only live seven or eight. Um, so they're all just a little bit different. Um, so our two main roles um, to, to work towards recovery um, at the hatchery is to captivate rear individuals for stocking. So we're trying to produce those numbers of individuals that aren't happening in the wild right now and then determine the life history and the requirements needed to get them to the adult stage. And in that, we'll figure out maybe what's happening in the, the creeks and the rivers that is not facilitating that for them. Um, we're looking at road stream crossings. We've gone through um, in the like the Grays Creek dry prong area, um, there's been a lot of work out there to rate each of the, the road stream crossings and culverts to see what degree of failure they're in or what things may be causing issues for fish passage, um, which we'll talk about a little later how the fish are really important. And so we're, we're one piece of the puzzle. So other people are working on the culvert stuff, um, but we also are out there seeing that those issues and helping to report and collect data on that. You're actually trying to grow them in the hatchery there? Yep. So providing like host fish for them for the parasitic stage? Yep. Yeah, it can get uh, really interesting. And so part of the, the hatchery work that we've done with this captively rearing stuff, um, you kind of have to start at the bottom sometimes. You got to figure out which fish is a host. Some mussels, um, they're kind of a, a user of all fish and they can reproduce on anything. And then other species have one or two fish that they'll use. And I think we've looked at about 30 different species of fish that could be found in the same areas as the mussel beds. And we've only found that grass pickerel or chain pickerel will um, produce transformed mussels into juveniles. And so after years of trying common species that you might find like the darters and the shiners and all this stuff and not getting um, any transformations, um, with the Alabama pearl shell, they actually found that 
redfin pickerel works. So we tried grass and chain pickerel over here and, and we got transformation. So now we know our host. So now we can say, okay, where do we got to get host fish from? How do we not deplete the host in the wild? Can we have a production program for them? And then kind of work up from there and then figure out what they need. Okay, that brings up a serious question. Because I know around here there's idiots that have dealt with them. If they catch a chain pickerel, they kill it. Mm -hmm. Because you told the bass. And I've dealt with one person like that. I won't go any more mm -hmm. that. We love them because they're great fly fishing yeah. species. And I release all that I catch. Is there a problem if you don't have chain pickle in that system that you used to have? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you can't propagate this, this muscle? Yep, so that's one of the things that we had need to take into account as we're developing these programs and looking so at the data. You think maybe that you might have to raise chain pickle or red pickle. I'm not red, red pickle. Uh, right. Yep, so that, that is an option in areas, but we need to figure out what the the carrying capacity for an apex predator is. Because we can't just put hundreds and thousands of pickerels out there because then they will eat all the little fish. So we have to go back into the data and figure out what the abundances used to be um, and then if they've changed while the muscle populations are decreasing. Because if they haven't changed, then it might be another factor. Uh, maybe it's the movement of the fish. And we'll, I'll get into some more of that a little bit later. We've brought some caption here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not super loud. Okay. Where did y'all determine that chain pickle was a host? Um, so in the lab <laughs> setting, yep. Because these small streams like out here in Kasachi, mm -hmm. there's not that big a population of naturally in them. Yeah. And it's shallow water. So I mean y'all are using the chain pickle as a host to get production to put the pearl shells back in the stream, right? Yep. So yeah, we, we collected some wild ones the first year and then we held on to those and they've spawned in the pond. So we've used their, their progeny basically to do the next several years of the program and that way we're not taking them out all the time. Um, there will be years where we need to take a few here and there, but we try not to use too many. Um, a fish can transform between 1,000 and 6,000 mussels, so we don't need a huge number of them all the time. How large are the mussels when you're attached to the fish? Um, I'm envisioning this 2x mussel hanging the side. No, 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 no. Um, th so the Louisiana pearl shell is about 70 microns, so it takes 1,000 microns to make a millimeter. So. Uh, I have to use a microscope. <laughs> they're tiny. And then once they grow and they're, they've transformed into a juvenile from a larvae, they'll drop off at about 0.3 millimeters. So they grow quite a bit, but they're still, they look like tiny little pieces of sand in a petri dish until they get bigger. And I've got some pictures and stuff. They're kind of hard to see. Um, but basically, so this is kind of like how we do our captive rearing at the facility. So we'll have our host fish in these green tanks um, kind of over here. And so we have one fish per tank since these guys get really aggressive with each other. Um, we don't want to stress them out anymore. Um, so we keep them kind of on an individual basis. Um, we feed them every day, we clean them, all that stuff, keep them healthy. And then when, um, when the Louisiana pearl shell females are ready to go in the spring, we go out every week and we check the adult females. And we actually open them up just a little bit. And in their gills, you can see that they are now gravid or pregnant and ready to likely release their larvae. So we'll bring those females back to the hatchery, let them release the larvae into a, a small bucket. And then we take those little larvae out and we put them in a bath with the fish. So these buckets right here, each one of these has a pickerel in it and about a liter to a liter and a half of water. And then each one gets an air stone. And then when we're, once we've enumerated our, our larvae, we put them in the bath with the pickerel and the aeration stone keeps them moving throughout the, um, the water column. And as the fish breathes, pulls them through the gills and they start closing up on them. So that's how we get them infested onto the fish in the lab. In the wild with this particular species, they are a broadcast spawner, so they have millions of larvae and they rely heavily to our knowledge on the timing of the pickerel spawning so when the pickerel come up the creeks to spawn is the same time that these mussels are releasing so they're likely to to run into or encounter the glochidia through the water column um, other mussels will use some different kinds of mechanisms and i've got some really cool pictures of that later um, but the pearl shell they just to our knowledge they just have lots and lots and lots of them and just just keep putting them out and just hope that it runs into those fish at the same time. So where about should they hook onto the fish? Like on, gills? on the gills, yep. 
and I'll have a I'll have a little picture of kind of what that looks like later too. And so once they're on the fish in those buckets, we put the fish back into the those green tanks. Those we, we call those Z-habs. And then this particular species of mussel will stay on that fish for about 30 to 50 days before they start dropping off. And so I use these little tiny catchers with mesh that I built and I put them behind the tank. And as they drop off onto the bottom, they get sucked up the back and then I can count all the mussels. So some years I've only had a few hundred mussels and some years I've had 40,000 drop off. Um, and so we have figured out the transformation part of it pretty well. Um, each female is going to have more or less success. And then if fish have been used in the wild before and we don't know it, they have a little bit of an immunity to accepting those on their gills. They've kind of built up a resistance. So we may have a, a little bit of a dud fish or a dud female. So we try to use multiple females on multiple fish. So we have our best chance of some success. Once they drop off, we use these, we use various types of systems to grow them out. And so we typically start with some kind of static tank. It just has water, food, and sediment in it. And the little tiny mussels, which this picture is really bright, but we have a little one right here. Um, they have a foot. Um, that's the, the appendage that everyone tends to call a tongue because it slides out. It kind of looks like a tongue, but that's their foot. That helps them orient. But when they're really young, they use it for feeding. So we call it pedal feeding. They go out in the sediment and they grab bacteria and algae and they suck it back in. And then as they get older for this species, they start filter feeding. So we have to provide them food in the sediment before we can get them filter feeding. So we, have, we take sediment straight from the creeks where they are from so that they are getting the same food that they would in the wild. We don't want to change too many variables for them. Um, Hopefully that's not one of the issues is the sediment as we move through the program, but um, there tends to be less flatworms and, and other issues in the, the native creeks compared to the ponds at the hatchery. So we take sediment right from the wild. So um, like we talked about a little bit earlier, we had to figure out what the host fish was. And so this took several years of one figuring out when do we know when the mussels are gravid. Uh, mussels fall into two categories. You have long-term and short-term brooders. And so the long-term brooders, you will find females that look ready in the fall and they'll hold them all winter and then they'll release in the spring and summer. And short-term brooders will typically, um, they'll become gravid in the spring. There's about a three to four week window that their whole process goes through from when they accept the sperm, fertilize, and then release the larvae. And so these guys happen to be a short-term uh, brooder. So for many months they were going out and they're saying, we don't see anything different. We don't know. We don't know. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, we see it now. So now we know um, in the spring, we start in mid-February going out into the creeks, checking mussels. And we usually go once a week for the first couple. And um, as the temperatures rise, usually once we hit 60 degrees, we know that the mussels are going to start charging that um, moving through that process pretty quickly. So if the temperature keeps going up, it'll go faster. And if the temperature comes back down a little bit, it'll go slower. But we can kind of gauge via temperature how ready the females are going to be and how often we need to go in the creek. So they use different fish. There's a, a couple pictures. Uh, I'm, not kind of sh I'm not sure what kind of uh, shiners over there. Um, and then they, they tried a uh, brown bullhead that was supposed to be one for a while and we, we never really got anything. Um, and then once um, the other species, the Alabama pearl shell folks, they found pickerel. So we tried that and we've got really good success. So this picture right here, it's a, it's a little bright, but this is actually one gill arch from inside of a pickerel. And all these little dots are muscles that are attached onto the filaments. So those are our parasites. Nope. So what were they using here where they're done? Not, that's what they've out yet. Well, they they they'll use the pickerel in the wild. Yep. Yeah. But there are pickerel in those small Yeah. Never seen the grass little yeah, but you'll, both of them will be in there, but grass are definitely more prevalent. But it's a short window when they're in those areas because they hang out in a certain area of time of the year, and then when they're ready to spawn, they go further upstream or further into the tributaries. And so they'll overlap with these muscle beds more often during that time. So is that visible with the, 
human eye with that? On the gills? Um, yeah, a little bit. And there's a picture in here later. Um, it just kind of looks like there's little sand dots stuck to their gill, but you can't tell that it's a muscle unless you know what you're looking for. Um, so then we have, um, we'll get back into the muscles in a more general uh, setting at, at the end. But um, So we'll just stick with the hatchery stuff for right now. So our other recovery species is a gopher tortoise. And so this is a Head Start program. Um, Emmett is a other biologist that uh, he's my counterpart over there and so he's kind of in charge of this program and so he actually goes to the Hattiesburg area in Mississippi and collects wild eggs. So the picture on the right is a nest that they recently uncovered of gopher tortoise eggs and then on the left those are the hatchlings that came from that. And so the Head Start program is really cool because we get uh, wild genetics. The tortoises do what they're going to do but then we just give them the best chance of hatching and surviving. So in the wild, um, some areas have 0% hatch because of uh, usually predation, but um, so you'll get raccoons and possums and other mammals in there, fire ants, um, sometimes natural disasters, and so they'll get no production for the year. So when we go out and collect them and incubate them, we can, the last two years we've gotten about 75% hatch um, of these eggs and then we'll grow them for two years and then uh, from there they'll get released back to where they came from so we know the location of each clutch and they'll get put back out into the landscape there um, eventually we'll work with the ones hopefully here in Louisiana but there's a bunch of paperwork we have to get through with the state and stuff first um, they're considered a keystone species um, part of the reason they have the name gopher tortoise is they're a burrowing species and so their burrows are uh, really, really important on the landscape. They're typically found in the longleaf pine forest. And so it's kind of the, the barrens underneath. And it's just some needles and a lot of sand and a lot of dirt. And, uh, but at, through doing research on these guys, um, it's been noted of upwards of 300 other species using those burrows either at the same time or after they've been abandoned. So they've found owls and snakes and frogs and spiders and all sorts of stuff using these burrows. So they're really important to that whole ecosystem that these guys are out here digging around. And so this is kind of what a burrow may look like. And so some of the animals will hang on the outside waiting for stuff to come out. Other stuff will use it as their own home and nest. Sometimes they live together. Sometimes they just try to ignore each other. Um, but it's just, it's, it's really important to those areas that they have these deep, um, these deep burrows because a lot of things like the frogs and the amphibians and reptiles, it gives them a place to go and retreat from the heat and it gives them some moisture. Um, it's nice and humid down there. Um, I think they can go, I think they can be like 10 feet wide and 40 feet deep. Somewhere around that, maybe I have those flipped, but they, they're pretty big. And then they have tunnels that come off of them. Other stuff will go in there, like you saw the skunk on there. They'll actually dig, you know, towards the top, their own little burrow. Other stuff will go the other way. And so they kind of just start everything for some stuff. Um, this is the range of the gopher tortoise. So the, um, the yellow area is where they are... Um, is like where the main part of the range is. But this, this part here... Um, that just catches the Lake Pontchartrain area of Louisiana, that blue, that's where it's actually federally threatened at. So the other part of the range, they're actually doing pretty well. They have larger clutches and more survival. So we don't know what it is about this area that they don't do as well, and they have smaller clutch size. So we're working to help them out more locally. Um, they have programs in Georgia and Florida um, for these guys. A lot of people have them in their yards in Florida. And so they have little gopher tortoise parent signs and they watch over them and make sure they can hatch and all that stuff. So people really like them. Um, this is just a couple more pictures. Emmett's collecting another nest. And then this is how we incubate them. That's uh, vermiculite. So it's a, a synthetic um, substrate. And then these are all our, our buckets that have them in them. They have heat lamps and water dishes and um, they get little PVC tubes that we fill with sand every morning and then they dig it out every day. Um, and then we feed them a mixture of lettuce and vitamins and different things. Um, they get uh, baths to help them hydrate and they get a little spray with a water bottle for hydration as well. Um, 
part of our restoration work is alligator snapping turtle. Um, so this is another Head Start program. Most of the snapping turtles we have are from the wild. They're from the uh, Black Bayou Lake National Wildlife Refuge. ULM collects eggs, incubates them, and then we take the hatchlings and grow them out at the hatchery. We do have some turtles from Tishomingo National Fish Hatchery in Oklahoma, and that's part of a mitigation project where we just needed more individuals. Um, these guys have been declining through their whole range, um, so we, we anticipate they may get listed as at least threatened, but we're not really sure. Um, and they have the same kind of problem with predation as, as eggs, and they'll have as little as zero hatch in a year. Uh, raccoons, ants, other mammals, um, just people, activities, and whatnot. So we try to grow them a couple years, get them strong enough and big enough to where nothing's going to mess with them, and then we stock them back out into their, uh, their natural areas as well. Um, these are just some little tiny turtles. Um, one of them's getting a pit tag, and so that's kind of the same technology that your animals have when you get them scanned for a tag. Um, so if they get caught in the wild, you can scan them, and they'll know if they're a hatchery turtle or not, and where they came from, and what year they got stocked, and how big they were. Um, this is as they get larger, so this is a little bit closer to stocking size. And um, so they've worked on a five-year study to to determine the survivability of these, and they found, I believe, it was, um, I think it was about like 84% or so that they deemed were likely surviving after it. And then they found different areas that are refugia for these, so national wildlife areas, Barksdale, uh, a lot of Air Force bases and, and different military bases are actually really nice because they're minimally, minimally disturbed um, and public can't just go on there and do whatever they want. And then um, we're working on some life history studies and by we I mean the whole service, not just Natchitoches. And then this is one of the large ones that we had on site. Um, we had about 30, 30 adult turtles on site a few years ago as part of a um, federal court case, there was a illegal pet trading, and so we had to hold the evidence while they were waiting to hand out uh, sentencing and everything, and then they got stocked back into Texas where they came from. Um, but it was pretty cool. That turtle was about 170 pounds. How old was it? I have no idea. <laughs> Probably 50 to 80. <clears throat> um, Non-native species control. Um, there's uh, several thousand per year that get stocked into Louisiana and Tennessee waters. Um, we haven't done as much of this in the past. Uh, Private Jan John Allen National Fish Hatchery in Tupelo, they've been doing a lot more of the alligator gar work. They're a little closer to the Tennessee area that they're really trying to put some pressure on. And then they help control silver carp and the, invas the other invasive carp in the Mississippi and some of the, the big tributaries off of there. Um, just a, a photo of a small gar eating a minnow right here. Um, these guys it can be really hard to raise. They cannibalize each other very heavily. So sometimes you end up with 20 big fish instead of 200 medium fish. Um, and then why is invasive, invasive species uh, control important? Um, first, invasive species are non-native organisms that have the potential to cause harm to the environment. Um, sometimes these species are things that we brought here, not realizing the effects. <clears throat> and, uh, but a lot of times they're brought in through other vectors. Um, that can be moving bait buckets around, boats, shipping, stuff like that. And so um, the, the map on the right is the, the most current spread of zebra and quagga mussels. Um, those are invasive mussels from the Caspian Sea area. Um, I, like, I, like we said earlier, I'm from Michigan. That was the first place that they were brought in via shipping. And having seen them take over the Great Lakes, they are a species that you, if you can avoid having them in your waterway, you want to avoid having them. The biomass becomes huge. They take out all of the nutrients. They cover and attach to everything that's a hard part, including our native mussels. They'll actually get so thick on them that they suffocate them. They'll cover your boats, they'll cover your pylons, your ladders. They'll get in any kind of pumping um, hose that you have. They'll be on your ropes. They're really sharp. Um, I've been cut up by them before. 
and they're just they're pretty nasty um, and then we've seen you know the videos and photos of the the silver carp jumping um, it's part of their startle response when they get scared especially in shallow areas when they can't go down they go up and their biomass gets very large very fast so lots of individuals and so those are things that are re really real threats to our area both of those are found in parts of the throughout the Red River um, which is just a hop jump and a skip away from all these waterways that's the invasive mussels you're talking about? Yeah, on the, the right there. So um, if you go through Montana and Idaho, at every state border and throughout the state, they have boat check stations everywhere. They're bleaching your boats, they're cleaning your boats, they're drying your boats, they're doing anything they can to keep these mussels out. Um, so we work really hard to make sure that our water source is clean and that anything we stock out to other areas doesn't have stuff like this. And so far, the Cane River, where we get our water source for the hatchery, does not have either of these species in it. Um, but between boating and pumping, it's a really big threat to the whole area. And it'll affect us, but it'll affect everybody that's using or on the water as well. So um, these, again, just some photos. Um, Zebra mussels, these are attached onto some algae. So if that gets into your ballast water or in, um, up in your prop, it's really easy to spread them from place to place. They just need a little bit of moisture to survive a long time. And then um, we've got the jumping uh, silver carp over there. And um, people get hurt every year by those guys. Um, just some more photos of kind of the impacts. Um, there's a boat prop, the top two, those are covered in zebra mussels after sitting in water that has them. And then uh, again, the silver carp, you can see this person's trying to bow fish and they're about to get hit in the face <laughs> with one jumping. Um, and those fish can get 30 to 50 pounds. And um, okay, um, and then just a couple more pictures of the zebra mussels. This one always blows my mind. So this is Lake Mead. This is um, a brand new pipe that, that has never touched infested water. And these are pipes after two, four, and six months of being in infested waters. So people are like, oh, it can't be that bad. They can be really bad. Um, and then they have economic impacts. Uh, zebra mussels, they've estimated $3.1 billion um, over the past 10 years. And then local economy as well. People don't want to fish or put their boats there or they can't afford to, to fix their irrigation pipes. They can't afford to fix their docks and pylons. They're getting injuries. Um, I know in Michigan, they've closed multiple water treatment plants because they can't keep the, the pipes clean. They can't afford to keep them clean to clean the water. So they've closed them. Not a lot. Um, so in the Great Lakes, we have one of their native predators there with the round goby, but those are also an invasive species, so, which it came from the Caspian Sea. So um, things do over time kind of learn to eat them, um, but there's so much of them that it... Will radius sunfish eat them? Um, they would probably try. They might be able to get some of the smaller ones, but they're, they're attached to things by uh, bissel threads, and they're really hard to pull off. So if they can't crush the shell themselves, they're not going to be able to, to suck them in. I know they eat snails and stuff, but usually they can pull them in and work, or, work them around a little bit, and the zebra mussels would be a lot harder. They don't get very big, maybe eight centimeters, so they're, they're pretty small, um, but they're, they're just nasty. Um, so then we have our direct impacts. If they did come into the waterways for the hatchery, um, we may not be able to support the local recreational fisheries. If, if we have larvae from the invasive mussels coming through our waters, we might not be allowed to stock throughout the state. We might only be able to stock places that already have them, or we might not even be allowed to do that. And then um, it will affect some of our recovery of species, particularly the mussels or anything that's aquatic. Um, the snapping turtles will probably be fine, the gopher tortoise are terrestrial, so they won't be as affected. But it will vastly change how we do things and then how the community uses the waterway. Uh, <coughs> um, and then how do we prevent the spread of these invasive species? So we have our own control mechanisms. Usually it's visual and we can, we can test for different things. Um, and then we have the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers kind of campaign, and that's kind of the, the drain, dry, uh, drain and dry. So once you get out of the water, 
make sure you empty everything, let it drain out fully, and try to let it dry for a couple days before you go to the next waterway, especially if it's a known area with any of the invasives, really. <clears throat> Yeah, so the Red River has um, <clears throat> big head and silver carp, and there are, um, there are a couple areas where they've identified zebra mussels, um, but they're not, there's not a lot of research going on right now of exact locations of it. It's not something that's being fully monitored, um, but that's one of the things we want to look into um, over the next year or so because um, there's some local entities that want to pump from the Red River but the filter that they were supposed to be able to use to clear the water before it comes into the Cane River, um, it's not gonna work. It's, it's gonna get clogged up too much. So they just wanna pull water in freely, but then they're almost guaranteed to pull in whatever's right there. And so we know that the silver carp would likely come in. We've seen those through the whole Red River, all of Mississippi. Um, and then we know zebra mussels are in different parts of the Red River, but we don't know exactly how close they are to that pumping area. So that's one of the things we want to find out this, this coming year before we um, <clears throat> come to an agreement on how to fill the Cane River, because it needs, it needs um, some help to fill. They're, they're subject to low temperatures that kills them, right? Um, own, uh, what's it, uh, RG up there, where they got through refuge? They were dead by the hundreds. Like we had that big freeze after Christmas. Yep. And then just the whole water just covered it. So I guess we have to have a severe, severe freeze. Yeah, that could help. Um, so zebra mussels are more common, and they have a higher temperature tolerance, and then they, um, but they can't go as cold. But the quagga mussels can actually go colder than the zebra mussels. So we found in the Great Lakes that as you get deeper, it switches to purely quagga mussels. So they're both a kind of a little bit different threat, but they, they hold the same niche in the, in the waterways. Oh, the carp, yeah, yeah. I mean, the river are just flooded. There's everywhere. The water was covering the whole top of it. Where are they native? Where, where are silver carp from? Um, they're from Asia. So, yeah, they're, they're commonly called Asian carp, but we, we try to call them invasive carp with the, so. Question, back, back on the mussels in our creeks here. <clears throat> Do the fish, is there ever a stage where, like, top minnows or small fish feed on the mussels when they're in, like, the sand? Yeah, they'll get, they'll get eaten up a little bit. Um, sometimes, because um, they're so small, it's more likely bycatch. So if they're trying to eat something else and they pull it in. But as they get bigger, they will get more targeted um, by different, different uh, species and stuff. And then as adults, um, <clears throat> otters and beaver and nutria and different things will, will eat them. And then in other areas, there are fish that specialize in mussels. Nutria? Uh, I believe they've found some evidence of them. If they're, if they're kind of up on the shore, they'll opportunistically grab them. Um, and then so for the hatchery, what else do we do? We have environmental education. Um, we have the aquarium building that's open to the public. It's just a small self-guided aquarium. It gives people the opportunity to see pretty cool species of fish that they may never see in the wild. Um, we do a lot of muscle survey stuff, which is a little outside of our scope usually. Um, usually we're just production, but we've gotten into more of the research side with the muscle stuff. And then we do special events, kind of like this, um, and different outreach and things like that. Um, so we do a lot of stuff with the schools and, and the kids. So sometimes they come to us, sometimes we go to them. We love to take turtles and things that they can kind of interact with and just teach them about what we do and, and why it's important to the ecosystem as a whole. <clears throat> and then this is just our little aquarium. We've got some murals that were painted several years ago and a few displays. And then we worked with the Caddo tribe to put up two kind of diorama displays um, because there, <clears throat> there is evidence that there were um, the tribes along where we are on the Cane River. So they actually excavated um, some areas and they found a burial ground and some pottery and some tools and stuff. So we had them come and bless the land and help us put together kind of a pictorial of what it may have looked like. <clears throat> so these are muscle surveys and um, so this helps us figure out how our program is doing. We've been able to stock one year class of the Louisiana pearl shell mussels. We put out about a thousand individuals and um, Wednesday will be my third year of seeing how those mussels are doing. So I work with the Forest Service and we go out and we check for the juveniles. So this clipboard right here are ones that we found in the wild. 
These are ones that were tagged to ready to go out and be stocked. And so they were stocked at this size and you can see how much larger a lot of these guys are. Um, so that means they're growing and they're healthy. Um, we found quite a few of them, which gives us really good hope that they're surviving well out there. Some of the tags we couldn't find, um, but uh, hopefully we'll find some more this time we go out. We found a whole bunch of individuals that were never identified the first monitoring. Um, we found them the second time. So we think they're actually burrowing further than our, our reader can, can identify them. Um, and they're using that vertical space a lot more than we thought they might, which is really good, actually. Um, special events, we do a fishing derby. Uh, we try to do it every year. We haven't been able to do it since COVID started. Um, we had, um, we weren't allowed to have that many people on site for a couple of years. And then because we weren't doing much with the fish, we don't have enough fish to do our broodstock program and have people fish for them. So we're a little bit behind, but we're hoping next year we will have our fishing derby back. Um, it's free for the kiddos. They can take like three or five fish home usually. So it's a pretty good time. All right, so <clears throat> back to the mussels in a more general sense. Within the United States, there's about 300 species, and over half of them are in, having trouble. So they're likely state or federally listed. And so this picture is just, um, these are just the, some of the mussels you find in Wisconsin. And you can kind of get an idea of the different sizes and shapes and colors and textures and all the different things that go into identifying different species of mussels. Um, it can be very tricky. Um, so to the life cycle. So as I was saying, the pearl shell, they're more of a broadcast spawner. So they, they make lots and lots and lots of tiny ones and they throw them up into the water column, hoping that they cross paths with the spawning pickerel and they do their thing and they hope everything is good. A lot of others have different mechanisms to get a successful attachment, which is actually a, a, a better way of doing it. Um, so this picture, it's a little hard to see, but we always ask people, how many fish do you count? So if you can see, I'll give you a second. So there's three. So this is a fish, this is a fish, and this is a fish. And this is actually a lure on the mussel. So this right here is a mussel, this is an adult mussel. And this is a, a lure, which is part of their mantle tissue. And so this is a gravid female and she'll display this lure when she's ready to have her larvae come out. And um, whatever will eat these darters, most likely a bass or a bluegill, um, will come in to eat this fish, because it'll twitch it, it'll make it look like a fish kind of bouncing on the bottom. And as soon as it triggers that, it shoots all the glaucidia right into its mouth and its gills. So it directly puts them onto a fish. Now if something hits it that isn't a host, it will just not attach and transform properly, but they'll do this multiple times throughout the season. So they don't lose all their glaucidia at once. And so hopefully over all those times they got triggered, they will successfully have attached to at least one host. And so it's really, really cool how close a lot of these lures look to things you find in the wild and how well they mimic things. And I know you guys know as fly fishermen and fisherwomen, how important mimicry is. You, they, these things know the difference. And so certain traits get carried through over time and um, you get an, um, different forms of what makes the best lure. So here we have another fish, looks a little different. This one looks more like um, maybe like a black sided darter. Um, this one has like a strong lateral line instead of spots. This looks more like a, a crayfish or a crawfish as you guys call them. Um, and then they have um, conglutinate packages. So instead of having a lure attached to them, they build these little tiny packages and kind of float them out away from the, their own body. And so these are packages of the larvae. So it's, when a fish eats that, it pops open and releases all the larvae. So these look like larval fish. These look like stoneflies and chironomids. These look like little worms. Um, they have super conglutinates which will actually come out on this like jelly string and it may be several feet from the female muscle. So when a fish comes in to eat that, boom, a load of glaucidia right, right to where it needs to attach. So the muscles make these loads? Yep. So that's, that's their, their way of getting to their host. It's really cool. <laughs> um, so that being said, and like you brought up, the fish are equally as important as the muscle. We need the fish to have the muscle. 
Now in the lab setting, they have done in vitro work where they've put them on a Petri dish and been able to transform them, but it's very expensive, very tedious. And that's for muscles that are most imperiled and we just need to have individuals to learn more about. So in our setting, we're not gonna do that. Um, and so this is kind of just that picture of, this is the lure, here comes the fish, and this white cloud is all the glochidia just right into the gills. So now that fish is gonna have them all attached. So this looks kind of grainy. Those are all those little muscles insisted onto the, the gill filaments. And then this is it further under a microscope so you can see them a little closer up. So that's what it would look like. Um, in the wild, they typically will not become over infested with the moving water and everything um, by the time they actually get to attach. But in the lab, we can definitely put too many on a fish and harm them. But in the wild, it's a lot less likely to happen. Um, fish are extremely important to mussels for their genetics as well. So uh, if you have too many similar genes and alleles mixing, you end up bottlenecked and then you actually have less success as a population or um, a, a group of, of that species. And so those fish are what actually moves around. So this picture right here, there's a mussel. This is its trail, it kind of started over here, made a loop-de-loop. -loop. They don't move very far. They, they'll live in a space less than the size of this room most of their life. So when they attach to the fish and they hang out on the fish for between two weeks to a month and a half, the fish is moving all throughout that whole water system. And so they just randomly drop off. Whenever they're ready, they start dropping off. And so the fish keep the genes mixed around in a local area, but with enough movement that they can, um, they can persist. So why are mussels important then? So mussels are considered an indicator species for water quality, and they can actually improve water quality. Um, a single mussel can filter up to 15 gallons of water per day. And so this just has a visual, they put several mussels in a, an aquarium and let it sit overnight and you can see how clear it is compared to not having any mussels in it. Um, um, it's just a turbid system. It's like if you scooped out the Mississippi and just said, that's what we got. And then the mussels make it look like that. Um, so to a certain extent, that's good. Um, this is more for a visual representation. Native mussels don't typically group together in such large masses and beds that they take all the nutrients out of the system. But with the invasive mussels like the zebra mussels, their biomass can get so big that they deplete the nutrients for all the little fish and the invertebrates and stuff like that. So they, they play more into the, the natural balance of the systems that's developed over lots of years. Um, and so when these outside species come in, they don't know how to play nice with that. Um, they're also considered ecosystem engineers, so that means that they directly or indirectly um, modulate the availability of resources um, to other species by causing physical state changes um, in the biotic and abiotic. So um, basically, these guys will capture the organic matter, filter it while they're feeding, and they act as a heavy metal sink so that it will get put into some of their tissue and then their shell. Some of these heavy metals, they're natural in the system. They go up and down, but we also as humans add more to the system sometimes. So they help bring that down. It's a little bit safer for the humans to use. Um, <clears throat> but in doing that, then they also process all that food, the algae and the bacteria and stuff that's floating around in the water column. And when they excrete that, it directly puts that food for the benthic uh, invertebrates and the small fish. So they're kind of taking the upper water column, bringing it back down for the lowest, feeding all our little guys, and then the fish take it back up. And then they bring it back down. So they help complete that cycle. Um, their shells provide substrate and algae and um, protection for larval insects. Some fish will dart in and out of them. Darters love to hide kind of behind them. And if you get um, a dense enough bed area, they can be considered an underwater garden. So fish will come to them because they're kind of like a little reef. Um, and then they're firmly anchored in the substrate, um, especially as adult mussels. And so they can actually um, increase the tolerance of that system during flooding. So they don't get as much scour and as much sediment pushed downstream because they're holding it together. Um, so some of the reasons that they're struggling, um, a long, long time ago, uh, they were our main source of buttons. So if you notice now, your buttons are a little bit shiny and iridescent. Well, they're made out of plastic now, since the, around the 40s and 50s. But before that, they would go out, 
collect huge numbers of mussels and then stamp them out of the shells. They would just throw the guts out, stamp them, and then throw the shells. And so they took out such big numbers that a lot of species have had a hard time climbing their way back. And then that added to pollution, industry. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure issues. So this is a perch culvert that is likely too small when the river is actually up that high. So then you have a velocity barrier for fish to move up to spread the genetics or get to the beds where the mussels are at. Um, we have a lot of low head dams. And then we've got our invasive species. So these are two native mussels. And then these are zebra mussels that have completely covered them and are likely going to suffocate them if they don't get pulled off. So we have a lot of things working against us, but we go through a whole bunch of different um, kind of like models and, and strategies of do they have a high recovery potential and like what's our threshold to keep working with them. So since these guys are local, they're doing okay um, and we have the ability to likely produce enough other populations to get them back to a, a, a minimal number, they have a high recovery potential. So we are working with the pearl shell for that reason. So I have a question. Yeah. Okay. You, you, earlier you mentioned uh, beaver dams being the problem. After um, Laura, Hurricane Laura, a lot of trees came. They mm -hmm. Where we live, there's two creeks that come into Cotillo Lake and it blocked the creeks up like that. And I'm, I'm sure there were mussels up in there. Mm -hmm. um, how's, has that been an impact that's something y'all looked at and tried to mitigate? Yeah, we've looked at it a little bit. Um, we've had, you know, numerous big storms over the last few years that are a little more frequent than they've noted in the past. So that could become an issue. There is a natural pattern that these mussels have survived through for many years. And so they're, you know, they're, this creek may flood and some mussels may die off, but then that creek's gonna do really good. And it may have reopened that one with the flooding waters. And so there's a little bit of a pattern that we wanna keep as natural as possible. We've seen trees come over beds that we usually count. We just don't have access to them. Um, if it was a really important one, we may try to clear it, but we kind of just monitor to see what's gonna happen. Um, but a lot of times the mussels are, they're, they're pretty good at, going deeper or if the water's high enough it'll just push them downstream sometimes so the, the beds will kind of shift um, but it is something we have to take into account as we have these 50 and 100 year storms at 20 and 30 year time periods um, well, what about the drought yeah the drought's affecting a lot of stuff too um, the mussels are more concentrated to the middle there's some areas where it went down too fast and they got stranded um, Sometimes there's groups available to go move those mussels or they may take them into a hatchery setting until the water comes back up. But again, it's kind of that natural flow of things where you, there's only so much you can do, but we do have to keep an idea of those patterns. Um, yeah, it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to put all this work into it and be like, oh, another flood or another drought, and you just have to do what you can. Yeah, Grant and Rapides. So they changed the path of the Rondoli Creek. Okay. From, like, um, I think it flowed out of um, maybe Ayat or Kasachi. I'm not sure. Oh. What's the other one above Ayat? Yeah. No, uh, it flows out of Ayat, I believe. Ayat, and they, they changed that, and I have to wonder if that could have affected, because that's a natural flow flowing. Yeah, it, it's likely to have affected some kind of muscle. I don't know for sure if there's pearl shell in there. Um, I don't know exactly where all the beds are at, but if they, um, if they were doing any activities, um, they would likely have to, because there's endangered species or threatened species in there, they would have to work through a formal consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, this, to, this happened years ago. Yeah. So it used to be a nice, it did its own thing. It up. Okay. And a lot of that Great Creeks area and Ayat and all that kind of. Fed yeah. All that. And that could be one of the reasons um, that we're seeing certain populations that are declining faster than others. Um, but I'm not aware of that specific um, area. How far north? I know they're in Orleans, but the apple snails, how far north have they come? Oh, I'm not sure their total range right now. Um,
Really? Hopefully that bottle of snail, hopefully it was No, not the The other one. Yeah. Um yeah, there's there's so many different species that um, if if they're not too local, I've only been here a few years, so I'm st I've still got a lot to learn with some of this stuff. Um, but there's different agencies and groups that are monitoring that type of stuff. It's just outside of my scope right now. But I know in Michigan, that's one that was one of our um, like high potential. So when I was doing early detection and monitoring in the Great Lakes for a while, and so that was one of our look for this species. So. Yep. Yep. And then we got the uh, the mud snails up there, the New Zealand mud snails. No, they're these ones are teeny tiny. The apple snails are huge, yeah. But the the New Zealand mud snails are little teeny tiny guys, and they um, they're trying to get felt waders banned up in Michigan um, because it transfers so much stuff. We also have uh, didymo, which is we call it rock snot, and we have a lot of that that gets transferred really easy on felt waders. Um, so we ask people to bleach their waders. Well, those gopher tortoises, you showed 